This is for those who believe in the potential of science. Making brave choices, choosing to push the boundaries. This is why we believe in what science can do. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming to hear my story. These two famous founder, uh, executives at Intel also have important stories to tell. Intel co-founder Gordon Moore, it was actually last week the 50th anniversary of his famous prediction that computers would get twice as fast and twice as cheap every two years by doubling the number of transistors on a chip. So a transistor is basically a device that allows a computer to think and store memory by converting current to ones and zeros. To this day, Moore's astonishing prediction fuels rapid innovation around the world that's unprecedented in human history. But we are reminded by Bob Caldwell that there are limits to Moore's law because no transistor can be scaled down to sizes smaller than a single atom. And surprisingly, that's pretty much where we are today. As a result of this atomic limit, Caldwell is predicting a dramatic slowdown in technological innovation very soon. So these are two Intel executives, one accurately predicting the future and one predicting the end. But I ask you, are we, are we ready for the end? So in my role as a nanotechnology researcher and professor, I'm working to save us from a future of a society that can no longer advance technologically, because that would be a dangerous world. So the teams that I lead work to design new materials at the nanoscale to break barriers to innovation. And so the nanoscale is this scale that's just about 10 times larger than the size of atoms. And it's important because the physics at the nanoscale is different. And it could bring tremendous benefit to our society as we figure out how to use it wisely. So now, I may look like a mild-mannered professor, but if you take another look, you might be surprised at the powers unleashed by my research. <laughs> my trusty sidekick is the amazing carbon nanotube. A carbon nanotube is a type of carbon, a basic form, similar to diamond, graphite, and that one that looks like a soccer ball, right? A carbon nanotube can conduct heat four times the rate of copper. It has 10 times the strength of steel. It is so lightweight and strong that I can lasso the moon and pull it to Earth. Now, my muscles might be sore, but the carbon nanotube would be perfectly fine. The carbon nanotube's fantastic properties are enabled by the beautiful order of its atomic structure. Only a few atoms in diameter, the carbon nanotube can be grown to 100,000 times its diameter in length, enabling us to make super strong, lightweight, long fibers. Now, I'm particularly interested in the carbon nanotube's ability to conduct heat. That's because the carbon nanotube conducts heat better than any material known to man. And that's because the carbon-carbon bond is very strong and carbon atoms are very light, which is a simple rule to remember if you want to know how well a material's atoms can conduct heat. If they're bonded strongly, if they're lightweight, then they'll be efficient heat conductors. I'm especially interested in the carbon nanotube's ability to conduct heat because I know each and every one of you has experienced your laptop getting hot. And one of the major barriers to technological innovation today is the overheating of electronic devices. Heat is a barrier. And this problem happens on satellite electronics, to your iPhones, or nearly every single electronic device. With the help of carbon nanotubes, I'm commercializing results from my research that are the best known heat dissipation materials for electronic devices. One application we work on in particular 
is radar systems for air missile defense. The more powerful the electronic device, the further out we can detect to prevent dangerous surprises. But heat is a barrier to more powerful radar systems. Our carbon nanotubes are solving this problem because we can make them into vertical arrays that are soft like a sponge to fill the air gaps between a chip and a heat sink and have conductivities like metal so that they're the best material possible for that application. And when we're done breaking down heat barriers, we're going to tackle the problem of doubling the performance of current solar sails at half the cost using a game-changing technology that we call a solar rectenna. I'm really excited about a solar rectenna. So a solar rectenna converts the sun's energy to electricity in a way that's completely different by using a process similar to how a radio antenna converts its signal to a radio or a song. Only the, the radio antenna in our case is a carbon nanotube antenna. It's very, very small because the electromagnetic waves that come from the sun are at the size of a few hundred nanometers. So this process of rectenna is the technology that could be the game-changing technology that finally brings cheap and clean energy to the whole world. If you're excited about that, stay tuned for what that company that I started will do. So I wasn't born doing all this. You know, when I was your age, I had dreams of having superpowers and saving the world. But where I am today requires a look back at where this all started, because it certainly didn't start with nanotechnology research. I grew up in Pensacola, Florida, where Hall of Fame football players are born. At eight years old, I was a legend. I was known for once carrying three boys on my back 10 yards for a touchdown, and my pants were falling down in the process. <laughs> Being good at football was who I was. But thanks to my dad, a mechanical engineer, I also liked math and science. He even put a whiteboard for daily al algebra challenges in my room in middle school. When it came time to go to college, and because I wanted to be the best at academics and football, I decided to go to Vanderbilt University. Vanderbilt's known for tough academics, and they compete in the SEC with the kings of college football. So I was, I was excited about that. So my freshman year, I walked onto the Vanderbilt football team as a lineman, which, which basically means that despite my status as an all-star in my hometown, they didn't really want me on the team, so they didn't offer me a scholarship. But I was okay with that, because I had a partial engineering scholarship. But I needed an athletic scholarship to afford my second year. My first semester at Vanderbilt kicked my butt in so many ways. It was completely different from what I was used to. I got better in my second semester, and I started to work out and shape my body into what a college football player was, was supposed to look like. You know, my, my chest was finally sticking out further than my stomach. And, and even by the end of spring football practice, I was optimistic about earning a scholarship. So the day after spring practice ended, I went to the gym to shoot basketball with a couple of buddies. And it was an intense competitive game. I was flying around. My more athletic body was making plays. And on one play, I jumped up above the rim for a rebound. And I came down and landed on someone's foot and hit the floor for probably the third or fourth time that game. But this time, I was on the floor in a different type of pain. And on the way down, I heard a pop in my knee. And when I got up, someone tried, finally helped me up. I tried to brush the pain and the pop off and just thought I sprained my knee like I've done before. Uh, but at this point, my knee was swollen to the size of a grapefruit. So I hobbled over to see the team doctors. And after their test, they told me that I tore my anterior cruciate ligament, ACL. And I can't tell you that I knew where that was in my knee. But what I heard them say was that I needed major surgery and it was going to take a year of rehab for me to return. I tried to stay positive, but my eyes were turning red. I was holding back tears. And if that wasn't enough, they followed by saying, we can't pay for your surgery because you're a walk-on. I had just turned 18. I was struggling to get over a tough first semester academically. 
But now my football dream was gone. I added to my family's financial burden, and I felt like I lost control of my life. I didn't have a plan for that. So I returned to Vanderbilt my second year, my sophomore year, despite financial difficulties. I took a job as an equipment manager on the football team. I had to swallow my pride for this job because it kept me close to my former teammates who were doing what I was supposed to be doing. And I even had to stomach jokes from some of my former teammates um, based off of the movie Waterboy, when Adam Sandler came out around that time. Hey, Waterboy, bring me some water, they would say. But I was an equipment manager, not a water boy, idiot. <laughs> I also started research that semester with one of my favorite professors. We designed code for engineering software, and I, find the work, I found the work to be surprisingly therapeutic. But I was eager to get back to the field. And in that summer, I lived in the weight room. I became a monster. I was so strong, I was curling as much as 100 pounds with each arm. So my junior year, I took out loans, and I headed back to the football field. I was finally back. I felt good. I was in shape. I switched to a new position, fullback, because I thought it gave me a better opportunity to earn game time. But my plan was still not working, and I didn't get any game time. And I really was getting frustrated by the lack of opportunities to prove myself. One day in practice, I went out for a pass, and I made a turn. And the defender came up and hit me on the turn, which they do this all the time. But on this particular play, they caught me in a weird position, and my repaired knee gave way, and I hit the ground in a familiar pain. I couldn't believe it. It was pure agony to wait for the doctors to tell me what I already knew, that this time my football career was over. I found comfort in research the spring semester of my junior year. And that summer, I picked up a project converting waste heat to electricity with nanostructured diamond. This was really cool stuff. I had a small role on the project, but the professor and the work, I was so excited about it. And this professor, he could sell it. I could see myself at the end of this summer potentially leading a nanotechnology company one day and maybe even going to grad school to learn more. But who was I kidding? I, I could barely afford to finish my undergraduate degree. So the thought of graduate school was just too much to think about. My senior year, I continued research, and I was back on the equipment staff. I got a promotion. I was the head student equipment manager. The job made me feel like a loser, though. Not that there's anything against being an equipment manager, but every day I went to work, it just reminded me of my failed dreams. And it was just really difficult. Near the end of that season, the football coach got fired, which happens in big time sports when you don't perform. And I was sitting in the equipment room when my boss told me who the next coach was going to be. But I didn't care who the next coach was going to be because my playing days were over, and I was getting ready to graduate in a few months. But I looked them up anyway, checked them out. I saw that in his offense, the fullback had a key role. And I thought, well, the previous coaching staff didn't really use a fullback, so who would play that position? Now, my knee was feeling good at this point, and I was in pretty good shape. But the thought of me going back to play after what I had been do through was absolutely crazy, right? But the thought, it just kept lingering in my mind, which was dangerous. <laughs> my dream was calling me, right? And my knee could be fixed if I broke it again. It's hard for me to explain to you what a new coach's face looks like when the head football manager walks into his office and says that I want to play now. Following that with, oh, and I'm recovering from two ACLs, probably didn't help. That winter, I pushed my body to the limits during conditioning. I had never stopped lifting weights, so I was probably one of the strongest guys on the team at this point. But I lost a lot of my coordination and agility, which was difficult to get back. And the coaches didn't give me a pass for that. So some of them tried to run me off. I'd like to say that I was given a shot at a great comeback story. But when spring football practice started, I was listed behind five other fullbacks, 
Two of them were walk-ons, and one of the guys was smaller than one of my legs, which was a nightmare. The first four days of practice, I was virtually a spectator, and it occurred to me that despite my efforts, that I might just need to move on and salvage my chance at getting a good job after graduation. But I gave it one more shot. I visited the coach after practice. I spoke frankly of my circumstances, and I asked for a chance to prove myself. And to his credit, he gave me that opportunity. He said, I'm going to give you one play, so make the most of it. See, my role as fullback on this play was to lead the ball carrier through the line and make the key block for a successful play. Now, I never got a shot on the field, but I was ready. Proper footwork was key for this play, and I practiced in front of my mirror in my room many, many times. So I led the ball carrier through the line, and I had unleashed a collision on the linebacker. The pop of our pads probably could be heard at the top of the stadium. And this guy, six foot four, 240 pound, all American linebacker, I drove him into the ground. And the team just got excited. The ball carrier zoomed by me, touchdown. But I stayed cool. Because it was gonna take one more than one play to get me excited after what I had been through, which completely added to the disbelief on the coach's face. And when the excitement calmed, he kind of looked at me almost like a dare and said, do it again. <laughs> the element of surprise is gone. But in that moment with what was put in front of me, I was unstoppable. And in two plays, I went from being the sixth string fullback to competing with a high school All-American for the starting job, which I eventually won. Booyah! <laughs> Touchdown. So Joy Cola was alive. And I was headed to graduate school, too, for engineering, because I finally got a football scholarship. I was recently recognized with the highest award that our government gives for young scientists and researchers for my work on nanotechnology and energy. Got to go to the White House and shake the president's hand in the East Room. Got a great photo to prove it. I couldn't imagine my life being as it is today. Being forced out of football because of injuries introduced me to research, which is a major part of my life today. But when I think back, it was overcoming my injuries and returning to football with success that ultimately pushed me into graduate school. And probably gave me the confidence and determination to do as well as I did when I was there. And after graduation, professor, and as we say at Georgia Tech, one hell of an engineer at one of the finest research institutions in the country. Georgia Tech. Thank you.